mad dog nativism, um, and, uh, all of a sudden it occurred to me, I hadn't remembered this, and I wish I had because I would have looked it up, but people probably remember the Sloan conferences that would happen in, I guess, in the early 70s or mid-70s, and there was this really interesting volume that of papers from that that Zen had edited. It's very hard to find, actually. Um, I'm not really quite sure. Um, but there's this the talk that Jerry gives, begins as follows. There's a scurrilous rumor about how we do philosophy and psychology at MIT. It seems they claim that we sit around at lunch all day and say, what can we claim as an eight today? <laughs> <laughs> of course it's perfectly true. <laughs> and then he goes on to say, now after we got rid of all the obvious concepts like typewriter and electron, <laughs> we're just trying to get on the other and what really struck me about it, and of course it's a very interesting paper, and then the discussion afterwards is incredibly interesting. But what, uh, what really moved me about that was, um, yes, there was always a consciousness of, I, I believe this, I'll argue for it, but of course I can see how it looks kind of weird. <laughs> and, and maybe, as Michael Devitt said, revel in that a bit, but, uh, but also it just struck me as a certain kind of intellectual honesty and even a kind of humility, and I can see Ned's getting ready to tell me, oh, come on, but, um, <laughs> but still a kind of intellectual humility that I really appreciated. Um, so uh, another couple of s stories and then um, something just about my personal relation. Um, so, two very important summers that Louise and I spent uh, at Rutgers were the um, NEH Summer Seminar and then the Institute that Ernie and uh, Jerry, that Jerry ran at Rutgers back, I think it was 92 and 93 or 91 and 92, something like that. <clears throat> and that was just, those were very important experiences for us. Um, and uh, I'll never forget this one day. And I think this is right around the time, this goes along with what George was saying about the literature involving the element, the expert, and the like, that um, he was starting to uh, realize that it just wouldn't work. The, the, the view of narrow content that he'd been trying to defend for so long, he, he just he, he couldn't maintain it anymore. And we were sitting around at lunch, and he said, you know, if you think about it for five minutes, and then I just stopped him. And I said, Jerry, what do you mean if you think about it for five minutes? You've been defending this claim for 20 years. He says, well, what I meant is if you think about it for five minutes more. <laughs> um, and then this one was not his own criticism, but it was, it was an interest, it sort of captures the iconoclasm and the, and the, and the oppositional nature to both philosophers and psychologists. So here we were sitting in the seminar, and these two events were juxtaposed, and uh, I don't think he saw the irony, but Louise and I remember uh, experienced it quite deeply. So in the first part of the seminar, Somebody was uh, hectoring him with various kinds of counterexamples, and at one point, and, this, and these were all philosophers in the, in the audience of the seminar, and at one point he just got um, exasperated. He said, you know what the problem with philosophers is? They think that if you have you know, one piece of data that goes against your theory, you've got to give up the whole theory. That's not how science is done. You keep with the theory, and then you know, it goes on and on and on. Okay, then we don't hear about it for a while, I think we took a break, and then we come back uh, from lunch or something from the break, and then we're discussing this uh, issue in psychology, and he says, the problem with psychologists is they don't get the force of a principled counterexample. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we didn't say anything. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so of course, uh, like everybody else here, um, uh, Jerry's impact on my life was profound. I'll never forget 
Um, I started uh, graduate school at Harvard in 1975, and I guess that was the very year the language of thought came out. Um, and uh, when I got to graduate school, I met George within something like the first week, and I told him I was interested in philosophy of mind, and pretty soon he told me, well, you have to come to this seminar of Jerry Fodor's, and I went to that first seminar. Um, Jeff Pullman was giving a presentation. I'll never forget that. Um, and I just, it just hit me in this way where, um, I guess that's sort of Louise described it as well. I just thought, oh, I see. Oh, there's that way of thinking and looking at things. It, even if I wasn't sure I agreed with it yet, and I, but it just felt, it felt, profoundly almost moving to me and like some kind of warm bath that washed over me and said, oh, okay, yeah, I get that. I see where this is going. I see how you do this. This makes sense to me. Um, and from then on, um, of course, I um, was extremely influenced by him. Um, Despite the fact that, of course, I mean, we all have these anecdotes, and I benefited tremendously from talking to him and arguing with him and the like, but I was trying to think what my what personal relation to him was and what he meant to me, and I have to say, in the end, it was his writing, actually. They're just pieces of writing that, again, had affected me in a way that um, just formed my intellectual development. And I'm thinking of, so let me just mention a couple of things that are my favorite pieces of writing. One of them is the paper that I hardly ever see quoted, the Paramecia paper. Why Paramecia don't have mental representation. I just, again, to really make that one work and, and the like, and actually, with, I, I don't know if Randy remembers, I brought that up in a talk he gave recently at UMass. Um, because it seemed to me that he brought up an issue that was a counterexample for that argument. But nevertheless, um, I thought, oh, okay, I've seen the slippery slope used all, you know, all over the place. I mean, people talk about slippery slope arguments. I've never seen anybody actually think about what's going on in a slippery slope argument. And it sort of connects with what Sue was saying. What matters about it? What is it that you, you really have to address when you're addressing a slippery Argument. And that article was a model to me of how to approach that kind of issue. And another uh, of my favorite articles, which I think Lila was uh, quoting from with the paint example, was on the present status of the innate discovery. Yes. Mm -hmm. Again, and it just, to me, profound and deep article about, again, how to think about empiricism, how to think about nativism. And again, it, I'm not saying. One has to buy it all, and maybe it didn't all work out. But but there was just something about reading that. It used to be. It was almost like taking a drug in a certain way. I used to find when I when I needed to read something that could make me feel good, <laughs> I'd go read a photo. You know, um, uh, there aren't that many. Philosophy articles, I have to say, <laughs> they, they feel that way, <laughs> even though they're. Um, so uh, um, I know Iris mentioned this thing that, uh, uh, and I've never had the opportunity to meet her before, and I was very happy to hear her thoughts. But she said, nobody talked about the Jewish angles. So I'm going to bring in Jewish angle. Because I, I was a rabbinical student before I <laughs> left to study philosophy. And one of the things you do when you're uh, uh, when you study Talmud, is you have this pantheon of rabbis, of figures. There's a, they, they play a certain role in how you structure, how you think about the world. Um, and it's just you know, a habit, a, a way I have. And when I was trying to think, okay, when I look at important issues in philosophy, in other areas, or just anything that requires thought. Who are the figures in my life that I have read where, yes, they 
they help build the foundation and the structure and the framework within which I approach intellectual issues. Um, I won't mention the rabbis, but some of them are still in there too. We never have heard of them. But the three, the three figures that come to mind are um, Chomsky, Boder, and Rawls, which is a and I, I sort of feel like a lot of my intellectual life is working out a lot of the interactions between those three figures. Um, thankfully, Jerry's work is still with us. And I can still, if I need to, if I need a little brush, I can go back and read the articles. I, unfortunately, not the arguments and the interaction anymore. But the work is still there. Thank you.